your questions later. Thank you very much. Russell, thank you for a focused, methodological, analytical, enlightening presentation, food for thought, I think, for all of us. Um, and now it's my pleasure to introduce you to Robert Safflo Satloff, Dr. Robert Satloff. Dr. Robert Satloff has served since 1993 as the Executive Director of the Washington Institute, where he also holds the Institute's Howard P. Berkowitz Chair in U.S. Middle East Policy. The author or editor of nine books and monographs, Dr. Satloff's views on Middle East issues appear frequently in major newspapers such as the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and Los Angeles Times. A frequent co commentator on major television network news programs, talk shows, and national public radio, he has testified on numerous occasions to Senate and House Committee concerned with U.S. Middle East uh, policy. He's got Matt Levitt in the audience to back him up if, in case there's any problems. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a real honor and privilege to me to be on this panel uh, and to attend uh, this conference. I want to congratulate you, Boaz. Um, uh, uh, this is really an exemplary uh, gathering, and, and it's a really privilege to be here. Uh, let me just take a moment before I begin um, to, uh, to echo uh, General Howard's remark about uh, the um, memorial to Nick Pratt yesterday and to add one further sentence. Um, uh, uh, Yesterday, uh, General Dayton spoke movingly about uh, Colonel Pratt. I want to add one sentence about General Dayton. Um, if there is a human embodiment of the principle um, that America's responsibility is to help provide Israel and its neighbors the opportunity for a secure peace, it is General Dayton. And so I wanted to underscore that enormous contribution. If, if I can also just make one, um, one sort of odd personal remark, um, uh, I want to send my condolences to the family of Stephen Sotloff. Uh, Stephen Sotloff is not Stephen Sotloff. He's not a relative, um, no personal connection whatsoever. But over the last week or so, I've uh, gained a sort of odd personal connection to Stephen Sotloff. If you Google my name uh, with ISIS or beheading next to it, um, you'll find uh, that I've been killed several thousand times because uh, uh, journalists, uh, I checked this morning, 6,000 media references to my name having been beheaded. Um, and it's a very disconcerting notion. And this person who I have never met I have feel a certain connection with that I have never felt with somebody like this before. And so let me just take this moment to extend my deepest condolences to his family. I'm a bit a fish out of water, as we say in English, in this conference. I'm surrounded by counterterrorism experts. I am not one of them. I know something about modern Middle East politics and history. I know something about American policy in the Middle East. Uh, but counterterrorism is much too important to leave to people like me. Uh, let me offer some observations, uh, perhaps on the margin. I titled my talk, America, Israel, and the Long War. This is connected to an article of mine which appeared just yesterday, uh, which itself is a response to an article written by Elliot Abrams on Israel's strategic situation today. The essential point of Elliot Abrams' article is that Israel today needs to view itself as just having completed in Gaza um, one of a long series of episodes, a long war over its existence. To paraphrase, this is the idea that Israel, despite all of its remarkable successes in its young life, remains shackled with a series of profound threats and challenges that will likely define its strategic situation far into the future. He lists five of them, the uncertainty of American leadership, the ambitions of the Iranian ayatollahs, the barbarism of Sunni jihadists, the decadence of Palestinian politics, and the base populism of the Arab street. These, he argues, are regrettably potent features of today's Middle East. Perhaps these trends aren't immutable. Perhaps they can change. But they have depressingly strong staying power. In this world, where Israel is a tiny entity surrounded by circles of aggressive antagonists, the Jewish state can win battles but victory in the war 
real, ultimate, final victory in the form of full acceptance as a legitimate, even welcome partner in the region is a distant dream. Until then, he says, winning the battles while building the state should be sufficient. Dayenu. As much with what uh, Eliot writes, I found myself agreeing with quite a lot. Yes, there is no wishing away the mullah's dream of evicting the Zionist cancer from the Middle East or their practical efforts to bring it about. Yes, there is no contesting the visceral Jew hatred which passes for legitimate political discourse in many quarters of this region. In this regard, I was shocked just uh, 10 days ago to watch a clip uh, usefully cataloged by memory showing um, a senator preaching in a Jordanian mosque the historic Jewish bloodlust for Christian children. Shocked because this was on the official television station of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, one of only two Arab states at peace with you. Yes, there is no arguing that Palestinians have been cursed too long with leaders who looked benignly either at corruption or murder. And yes, sadly, there is no dispelling the common view among Arabs, Israelis, Turks, and Iranians, to the chagrin of some and the glee of others, that America is, well, preoccupied. I may quibble about certain points, but these are differences on the margins. In terms of his core proposition, I agree. The grim reality for Israel is, of necessity, the long war. And yet, despite everything, something gnawed at me. I still felt there was something significant missing in this argument. This is right as far as it goes, but it's not the whole story. And that point that, I'm, that it's missing is what I wanted to emphasize here this morning. What's missing? In my view, what is missing is the idea is that Israel is not just acted upon, but that it is an actor in determining its own fate. In an essay that justifiably celebrates Zionism as the most successful democratic nationalist experiment of the 20th century, the fundamentally Zionist idea that Israel plays a role in shaping its history beyond merely fending off enemies until they tire, that idea is virtually absent. Now before I go any further, let me put you at ease. Mine is not the if-only critique, the position of those who argue if-only, fill in the blank, withdrew from the West Bank, divided Jerusalem, gave up its nuclear deterrent, the list goes on. If-only, then the long war would be over and peace would reign. That's not true. To many of its antagonists, the problem with Israel is not what it does, but what it is, a sovereign Jewish state. And there's not much Israel can do about that. Setting aside, of course, the idea of a one-state solution, as perverse a term as Middle East politics has ever produced. But to recognize that there is nothing Israel can do to change the views of the annihilationists in Iran, the beheaders of ISIS, or as most of the rest of the Middle East calls it, Daesh, or the Holocaust deniers and canal flashers and blood libelers lurking in the dark corners of our society as much as in societies in this part of the world, that does not necessarily lead to the conclusion that Israel's actions have no impact on its strategic position. To the contrary, I would argue that Israel's actions can have a substantial impact. Israel's actions have a substantial impact on the political class in democratic countries that shapes critical decisions about diplomatic relations, defense cooperation, economic ties. Israel's actions have an impact on the truly undecideds, included the many highly educated and highly sophisticated people whose lives, shockingly, do not revolve around the complexities of the Israeli-Palestinian dispute. Israel's actions 
have an impact on the changing demographic, demographic composition of the American voting public, which no Israeli strategist should take for granted. And Israel's actions have an impact even on the vanguard of pro-Israel support among American and world Jewry, one of Israel's most undervalued but most important strategic assets. Now in the military realm, it's axiomatic that actions have consequences. Military victory enhances deterrence, battlefield stalemate invites continued adventurism by one's adversaries. Similarly, the idea that political actions should have repercussions should not be controversial. It's in this vein with all humility that I'll suggest that sometimes what is missing is the political dimension for Israel of fighting the long war. This would include, for example, discussing the strategic importance for Israel of liberal values, championed by no less than Benny Begin, for example, who is no security slouch, or the long-term benefits of embracing the high standards of ethical behavior that Israel demands of its warriors, a theme associated with, for example, Natan Sharansky, also no shrinking violet on security matters, and the immense value to Israel of projecting itself as ever ready for partnership in pursuit of real, secure peace, no matter how bleak the political horizons may be. And just as war planners limit vulnerabilities and shorten lines of communications to make them more defensible, Israelis might consider applying the same approach to the political side of the long war. One area where this could entail a serious national discussion is over disentangling Israel's military occupation of the West Bank, a moral imperative that derives from aggression in 1967 and the absence of peace, a moral imperative that Israel actually is empowered by for its military occupation in the West Bank, disentangling that from the highly political issue of the settlement project there. Now more generally, I believe Israel will face unusual challenges as America, after several years of a timeout, grudgingly accepts the reality that it too is in a long war. It's not the same as Israel's, a war over legitimacy, acceptance, and existence, but it's a long war nonetheless, a long war about Islamic extremism against both Sunnis and Shiites, though of different varieties, manifested through terrorism, unholy ambitions, and the pursuit of regional supremacy. Now, American strategy currently is muddled. I think that's what we call a diplomatic understatement. Tomorrow night, the president will explain the goal and how we will achieve it. Are we likely to go alone? No. But is 2014 the same as 1990? Actually, I think it's very different. In 1990, a president went to the world and said, there is a threat emanating in the Middle East. It doesn't affect us directly, although it could. It certainly affects our friends and allies. And to address that threat, we in America are sending 500,000 Americans, the blood and treasure of our society, to address that threat. If you would like to join us, he said, you're welcome. And we urge you, but we are going. Some came, they played a role, we know the story. In 2014, our president is likely to say, there is a threat in the Middle East and it doesn't affect us directly yet. It certainly affects our friends and allies. It is urgent, it is important. We're not coming with 500,000 troops. We're coming with support, we're coming with air power, we're coming with logistics, we're coming with weapons, we're coming with training, but we are looking for people to shoot to actually do the fighting. It is a profound difference between 1990 and 2014. This does not mean that we cannot succeed. I am quite confident that eventually we will succeed, but it is a different battle. What will be the strategy? Well, there are some who argue for a Shiite strategy, 
a strategy that embraces the Iranians, Assad, and their partners because they have weapons, they have will, they have experience, they have desire, and they're there. There's a great attraction in some quarters in Washington to this strategy. In the end, I think this strategy will not be taken because the costs of this strategy are too high. I don't mean the moral costs. For me, the moral course costs are too high. But for America, for our government, I think the political costs are too high. Namely, what embracing that strategy would mean for what I think will be the larger strategy, namely a Sunni strategy. And in today's Middle East, it is extraordinarily difficult to reconcile a Shiite strategy and a Sunni strategy. No, my guess the president will outline a Sunni strategy that begins with Iraqi Sunnis, harkens back to the awakening, and then expands to other Arab Sunnis, states and peoples. But there are limits. We should recall that our stock with Arab Sunnis is not so high right now. But just let me note, as an American, a citizen of the country with the highest rate of churchgoers in the world, where faith is a part of our national fabric, I am proud of the fact, I am proud of the record of America saving Muslims and protecting Muslims. Both Democratic and Republican administrations, Kuwait, Bosnia, Iraq, Libya, yes, it's not enough, but look at the record. It is a record that we have with pride. Recently, though, we have fallen way short in that record in terms of Sunni Arabs. We rightly and justifiably, if a bit late, came to the defense of Yazidis. We rightly and justifiably, if a bit late, came to the defense of Kurds. But we didn't for the Sunnis in Syria. And in Iraq, we permitted the virtual disenfranchisement of the Arab Sunnis. And our flirtation with Iran only exacerbates the political aspect of this problem. Some in Washington may survey the area and ask themselves, who can help? Who has assets that will help us attract Sunni Arabs? And this is where the story, I predict, may come back to you. Some will look to you. Some will look to Israel. They won't be looking at your military strength, but they may be looking at your political control of the West Bank and Gaza. And they may see in this an asset to help engineer a deeper Sunni coalition in the coming war against Daesh against ISIS. In my view, this is a wrong analysis. Sunnis are largely focused elsewhere, and Israel has its own contacts with Sunnis these days. I just came from Cairo and Amman, and I have to just, if I have to say one sentence, it is truly the first time in my professional career that Arab political and security leaders competed with each other, competed with each other, for who has the better relations with Israel. It's not something one uh, has normally heard in this part of the world. But that's not my point. My point I will leave you with this morning. My point is that Israel either acts or is acted upon. My entire professional life I've advised Israelis, take the initiative, control your destiny in politics as well as in security, or it will be determined by others that applies as much today to the U.S.-Israeli relationship vis-a-vis -vis potential Sunni Arab participation in the long war as it did in the era of Israel's founding. So let me just conclude with this final point. As the old joke goes, in one word, in my view, Israel's situation is good. In two words, not good. The humbling reality I see the translation works. <laughs> the humbling reality 
is that Israel is likely to live for a long time in the gray netherworld between these two extremes. Many factors will shape how light or dark the shade of gray will be. But Israel is not only acted upon, it acts. A strong, vibrant, creative, confident Israel. And that's what I believe you have. A strong, vibrant, creative, confident Israel has a role to play in this too. Thank you very much. Thank you.